Hi everyone, what's up? I'm Tim Vatiger from Midwest Supplies at Master Vintner. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about how to taste wine. Now everyone knows how to drink wine. It's pretty simple. I rarely have to teach that. Now you'll have seen people sipping wine and spitting it out and maybe gurgling it a little bit and perhaps you've wondered what exactly they were trying to accomplish. If you've also wondered where they get all those strange descriptions, hint of pears, peaches on the nose, a faint scent of fresh cut grass, where those descriptors come from is from the taster's scent memory and they're engaging it by tasting wine in a very specific and calculated fashion. This way is simple. Anybody can learn it. I'll teach it to you right now in a couple of minutes. And if you practice it all the time, you'll get better at it. Wine tasting is a skill like any other, like playing the piano. If you practice a lot, you're going to get better. So my advice, of course, is that you should practice heavily. Before we start, just a quick word on both the wine and the glass. This wine is a two-year-old Master Vintner small batch Cabernet Sauvignon that I made. I'll leave a link down below in the comments so you can see how it was made and what I did with it. A lot of people don't age their kit wine for a very long period of time. This is a, an unfortunate mistake because kit wine ages just as well as any other wine that you can purchase. And it gets better exactly the same way under good conditions. This has been in my cellar for two years. It's time to get a really good tasting on it. Now as for the glass, this is a Riedel Sommelier Cabernet Sauvignon glass, a Bordeaux glass. Uh, it is moronically expensive. I do not recommend that anyone buy them. There are better glasses for less money, except that this was a gift and I really like it. It's kind of cool. It holds 28 ounces. That's more than one full bottle of wine. And that's crucial. The key to having a really good wine glass is getting a big one. Well, why a big one? Because you want to be able to pour a good slug of wine in there and still get a swirl on. If you have some little puny three ounce glass, you can only put a quarter of an ounce in it and if you swirl it, it'll just fly all over the room. With this one, you can pour a good healthy glug in, get a good swirl, which I'll show you in a minute, and you'll, you won't have to worry about it spraying everywhere. Uh, and also getting a, a decent amount in the glass is important too. You want to be able to roust out a lot of the aromas and things. You don't want to just have that little film of wine in there that you have to search for flavors and aromas for. Step one of tasting is look. What you want to do is visually assess the wine for color, clarity, and hue. Now, a lot of people will pick their wine up to visually assess it and do this. This is bad. It's bad because all I see is some dark colored wine and there's a tree in it. Oh, look, tree. You'll only see what's behind the wine. What you want to do instead is to take the wine and hold it over a background that's neutral or white. A sheet of A4 paper, perfect. So I'm going to tilt this so I can see through it and look at the paper below. Why am I tilting it? Because I've got quite a good slug of wine in here. What I want to do is get a thin edge right here that I can look through because if I look through the bulk thick part, it's just dark and I can't get a really good idea. So I'm looking through this thin edge. So color, clarity, and hue. Color, this is red. When red wines are young, they tend to be purpley red. Uh, that's because red wine contains hundreds and hundreds of different red pigments and a couple of blue ones. If we remember our finger painting lessons from kindergarten, red and blue together make purple. So when red wines are young, they have this purple character. But that blue pigment is impermanent. It breaks down and leaves. So as wines age, they go from purple red to a true red or even a bricky reddish brown color. That's not damage. It can be oxidative damage. If you look at it and it's a, a dark brown color, or got a grayish hue, or just generally looks disagreeable, it's probably got an issue. On the other hand, if it's just moved to a real red color, but still is vibrant and has a, you know, an, a lovely sort of a, a reflectivity to it, a wholesomeness, then it's just aging and doing as it should. White wines range in hue from uh, water white for some very light examples of, say, Pinot Grigio, to a deep golden color for oak-aged Chardonnays, uh, and even some of the um, things like ice wine, 
or sherry can be uh, golden brown to uh, coppery and even a br brownish color. As a general rule of thumb, the lighter a wine is, the lighter the flavor is. The darker it is, the heavier the flavor. Now that's a very general rule of thumb. There are lots of exceptions. For instance, you can have a Pinot Noir from the domain Romanée Conte, and it will be light, ruby-colored, garnet highlights, uh, and have all the power and impact of a much more bold and robust wine than you would expect. They're amazingly concentrated wines. It's a trick of the Pinot Noir grape. Uh, on the other hand, you could have something like uh, a Grenache, which has got a nice dark, rich color, and yet it drinks like happy fruit juice. So they're, they're It's the same with white wines. If they're light, they're generally a lighter wine. If they're dark and deeply golden color, they're generally heavier. But be prepared to be surprised. Turning back to the wine at hand, we'll have a look here. This has still got a really good deep red color. Uh, it doesn't have the, the purpleness that it had when it was freshly bottled, but that's to be expected. It's still got some really nice ruby hue to it, uh, and it is a fairly deep red color. I'm inferring from this that this particular wine is medium to heavily flavored. It's going through the aging process, but it doesn't suffer any oxidative damage. Just a quick word on the clarity. Uh, all wines you'll be exposed to are going to be perfectly clear. Uh, the only time it comes into play that you might have a haze is if you're buying aged vintage Bordeaux or uh, vintage port, which can have a crust or a deposit in it. Those you stand upright and decant to get, them, uh, to get them away from the crust or sediment. Modern fining for the wine kits, and especially if you filter them as well, sparkling star bright. All commercial wines are, are as clear as can be. You don't have to worry about that. The next step is to smell, and this is where we're going to get 90% of our information. When we smell, we want to smell and think about those aromas going into our nose. The first step is to get them from the glass into our nose. You'll want to swirl. That exposes more of the wine's surface area as it runs around the inside of the glass, and that frees up a bunch of the low-weight molecular compounds, which are the things that you can smell, so that you can put your nose in the glass and draw them in. Now, if you are a little worried about swirling, and maybe you don't have a 28 ounce glass to put wine in, what you can do is you can practice on a flat surface. Set your wine down on a tabletop. This will keep it from, from uh, changing angle and, and maybe throwing wine across the room. Swirl by pushing the wine glass back and forth in a very short motion. You're not going around in a circle, that doesn't help. It's just a very short, rhythmic back and forth, just like that, and you'll see immediately the wines start to climb up the sides of the glass. And even from here, I can smell the aromas gushing out. Now, when you've got your swirl going, and you've got a bunch of those aromas floating inside that glass, it's time to put your nose inside and smell it. Now, when I say put your nose inside and smell it, I don't mean little teeny bunny sniffs. That's not going to help anything. Here's the deal. The speed at which an aroma molecule impacts your nasal bulb determines the amount of information it carries to your brain. The faster you smell something, the more information will be triggered in your brain. This is why dogs love to go on car rides and stick their nose out the window. It's like going from dial-up to broadband, from crappy cable to 4K Ultra HD. They are getting the broad view of the world. It's like mainlining the internet for dogs when they go for a car ride. Same thing for human beings. The faster you sniff, the more information you get. So teeny little sniffs aren't going to give you what you need. That's how hard you have to sniff. Now this is wonderful. I am getting a blast of dark red berries. Blackberry, black currant, there's even some, some black raspberry, some black cherry, there's cedar, there's hints of um, cacao, there's an incredible depth of fruit character there. Sniffing just that hard 
is what gives those descriptions their meaning. You have that information impacting your nasal bulb so strongly, it's easy to pick these things out. That after about three sniffs, you're going to reach olfactory accommodation. That means that you're stimulating those nerve cells with that information so much that they get overloaded and stop transmitting to your brain. When you do get overloaded, if you still want to keep smelling the wine, just turn away from it a bit, get some fresh air, and go right back to it. That's look and smell covered. Now on to taste. Tasting needs to be done in a very precise way to maximize the flavor you get out of the wine in the same way that sniffing done the correct way will maximize the aroma. Step one is you want to swirl the wine to release a bunch of those aromatics. Might as well get that hit while you're there. Step two, take a small sip, about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half, no more. You just want enough wine to sort of hold between your tongue and the back of your teeth. Just hold it right there in, in, in place. Because the next step after that is to draw some air through it. By drawing air through it, we'll do the same thing as we did by sniffing deeply. We'll drive some of the low weight molecular compounds across our palate to the back of our throat and they'll co-mingle at the back of the throat where it meets the sinus cavities and you'll get that blast of aromatics which will help guide your palate to the flavors. Now, you want to do this by sort of puckering up with that wine in the front of your mouth and reverse whistling, kind of suck a little. But don't inhale. You will get wine in your lungs and that is catastrophic, not just for the coughing, but also for the carpet. So little sips, little bit. Then you want to swirl the wine around the inside of your mouth, your entire oral cavity. The reason for this is you have taste buds, not just on your tongue, but also on your cheeks and your gums and the roof of your mouth and part way down your throat. Most people aren't aware of these because they don't pay attention to them. They never exercise them like quite this way. So we can take advantage of that. We still have some taste buds left there. Let's use them all. Work it around your whole mouth and uh, swish it about. You don't have to go crazy. You're not, you're not using mouthwash or gargling. But work it around your whole mouth and make sure it touches every surface. Then you want to swallow. And after that, we'll move on to the next step, which I'll get to. Now, it sounds complicated to explain it. Let's just do it. Quick swirl, followed by a little sip. You may be saying to yourself, why the big pause? <laughs> I don't know, they run in the family. The pause is the final step, which is stop. I swallowed the wine, let it go all the way down my throat, and stopped to think about what was happening. After you swallow, the wine will emiss with saliva. It will um, uh, uh, alter as it warms up, as certain chemicals volatilize, as others dissolve and are washed away. You'll get different levels of different chemical flavor and aroma compounds chasing themselves around your mouth. That's why it's important not to just take a swallow and move on, but to take that swallow and stop and think about the sensations and flavors that are changing in your mouth. So that's step four, stop. As I tasted that wine, the attack of it on my palate had an immensity of sweet fruit. It was almost like a, a jamminess, a richness of flavor. Uh, and it seems sweet at first, but it's not. This is a completely dry wine. It's the fruit that gave a sensation of sweetness and fullness. It tracked across my palate with dark fruits, uh, almost a cherry-like note, which is really cool, uh, buoyed up by some of that black currant and black cherry. And then as I uh, let it whirl, run around my mouth, the tannins really gripped in. This wine has gotten more tannic over time. Uh, that's because some of the fruit character has died down a little bit. Some of that initial sweetness has come back. Uh, uh, down off from the fruity characteristics as it matures and gets more structure and character. And the tannins have risen to the forefront and it's got a really nice smooth grip on the palate. It's not crunchy, it's not, not aggressive, but those tannins are a nice firm note. Those are the basics of how to evaluate wine. Look, smell, taste, stop. It's simple and it's fun to do. I recommend that you do it with every glass of wine you're offered. Whether you're at a restaurant or at a party or just opening a bottle at home, go ahead and go through the process with everything you taste. 
you'll be surprised at how much more impactful the wine is, and you'll also be getting a lot more out of everything that you're offered. You'll find out the difference between uh, different Chardonnays, different Cabernets, wines from different countries, wines from different vintages. That's the basic skill set for training your palate to learn more about every wine you taste. This isn't a way to turn yourself into a connoisseur. You're already a connoisseur. The definition of that is someone who knows what they like and knows what they don't like and chooses to pursue the things that they like. So you are already a connoisseur of wine. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your wine. And remember, with Master Vintner, you can uncork something special.